Hey everyone and welcome back to another Warcraft video. Today we're going to be talking about some of the most notable controversies in World of Warcraft. Why? Well, hindsight's 2020 and reflecting upon the history, you know what, it can be pretty damn instructive, pretty interesting. The goal here is more to highlight some of the largest controversies, discuss them, why were they so, how this stuff happened, and then attempt to take a more considered look at the situation. Plus, um, in this case, we're dealing with some of the really interesting social situations that have popped up in the game, so you know what, it's pretty damn interesting to go back over it. Okay, gear score. This is one that the old timers and the wrath babies, who at this stage themselves are getting pretty damn long in the tooth, uh, something they're going to know all about. Gear score was one of the largest discussed topics back in Wrath of the Lich King because it just began to seep into all aspects of the game, like all of them deeply. Okay, so what was gear score? Well, gear score was an add-on that would give your gear a score. There we go, job done. No, um, you tally that score up and then that would give you a number for your character. Now, the better your gear score, well, the more geared your character was. Um, but there were some drawbacks with how it all worked. Uh, but that said, gear score in some ways was a bit better than item level. It generally tried to be smarter taking something like, you know, gems into account. Um, you know, ideally it would just be a better representation than a simple item level average. So you know what? A good tool. But many great tools don't lead to great results. Why? People. So, gear score became an essential part of Wrath of the Lich King. Mostly, okay, if you were attempting to pug content. Remember, these were the days where, you know, there was 10 normal and 25 normal, 10 was easier than 25, and generally pugging was actually a thing. Um, so really, gear score became so important that you'd be, like, you'd be muttering your gear score in your damn sleep. Okay, not really, but it was super important. There were basically soon recommendations, gear score recommendations for specific types of content and difficulties, and these recommendations often got so high that it was very hard to initially get onto the gearing ladder. This, of course, was also a time where playing WoW for the average player was beginning to change. People, the average, was getting better. That might seem odd to some. Wrath had this perception of being very easy, especially because of the knack stuff, um, in comparison to TBC and vanilla. Well, that might be true in terms of the percentage of players that got through content and completed it. That's often due to attunements in the old content, slow gearing, other organizational factors, stuff like that. Um, but as time has went on, the fights in the game generally, they have got more and more complex, and yeah, technically a bit harder in terms of APM requirements. Um, but at this time, people were starting to sim more. Griparian's viral video about doing like good DPS, that doing so well was an indicator of this shift that, yeah, it wasn't just the tip-top players, also the medium players were beginning to take the game more seriously. For me, I started using femaledwarfhunter.com to do my hunter sims, I was paying attention to logs, all this stuff. So there was a shift in player behavior, in my view, and from what I can gather. And it's at the time that this shift happened, the gear score really came in, and it makes sense. People are becoming more analytical, we get this benchmarking number, and it all just kind of, you know, rolls up into a big snowball and keeps on going. Then, of course, Wrath was also quite pug-friendly. So, I, again, you know, I'd hazard a guess that more pugs here were being formed than ever, which, of course, meant that the rise of a quick comparative tool between players, that just makes sense. This, of course, though... Oh, this led to all sorts of degenerate gameplay, lots of rage, it was one of the most heavily talked about topics of the day, you could not avoid it, but eventually it fizzled out. Blizzard now displays item level prominently in-game, which actually right now leads to a lot of problems, especially in times like Legion, where secondary stats are really important. The legacy of gear score is something that in many ways can be felt to this day, and the controversy that surrounded it at the time really was a strong initial pushback that always accompanies a, a large shift in how things are done. And every time I think someone gets frustrated over a silly item level requirement or something like that, that's just kind of you getting a, a small little bump in that old bit of drama that really kicked off hard back in Wrath of the Lich King. And let's just stay on Wrath. The zombie plague, this, this thing's really a gem. So I was surprised to find out that this was controversial at the time because for me, it really was just one of the best things. Um, really, just one of the standout memories in World of Warcraft and one of my favorite things that Blizzard have ever done in game. So, the Zombie Plague was the lead-in event to Wrath of the Lich King. The whole idea was Arthas was launching attacks on our home territories using the plague. Basically, players would get infected then they would turn into zombies. And of course, as a zombie, you got to control your zombie, you would fight and infect other players. And this led to mass havoc, and havoc is really fun. Basically, it ground World of Warcraft to a halt. Here, here's kind of how it went down. On the first day, it started off pretty calm. 
infected grain shipments arrived at Booty Bay, and players who inspected that grain would get infected with the plague. They get a 10 minute debuff. When that ran out, bam, you're a zombie. Um, of course, I think if you died as well, it would turn you into a zombie. Now, there were Argent Healer NPCs who could remove that plague from you, so all wasn't lost, but I mean, normally I just turn into a zombie so I can infect other people. But then on the second day, infected rodents began to appear in the game's cities. They may have been cockroaches anyway. So this happened, and the disease only took five minutes to transform you. Plus, it could no longer be cleansed by players. And then on the third day, shit got real. Plagued uh, residents would attack you in low-level zones, and now the plague was down to two minutes. And necropolises appeared outside main cities. People really, you know, they tried to fight the zombies back initially. Yeah, soon it was, it was too much. Entire cities wiped out. Their NPCs killed, turned into zombies. At the time, I was trying to make money on the auction house which was a problem because the auctioneers were a bit more interested in gnawing on my brain, so the economy stopped functioning. Now, Blizzard did make things a little bit more bearable through tweaks as time went on. Over the next few days, the Alliance and the Horde would do quests to, um, to find a cure and to fight back harder against the zombies. But eventually then, I think it was like six days, seven days, maybe eight, um, the plague stopped operating and it's uh, full scale. Things were scaled back and uh, yeah, the plague was gone. During that brief time, though, consumed the whole damn game. A wonderfully unique moment to World of Warcraft that was not loved by all. And um, at the start, flight masters could get plagued. Um, and remember, this is before you could fly in Azeroth, so that was really inconvenient. If your class needed, like, regents, tough luck. Many of the vendors, again, were more interested in chomping off your arm. As much as these things were downsides, and I sort of understand where the drama came from and the negative feedback, I think it was kind of good in a way. Things like this have to have consequences to be unique. If you want to create a, a living world, like, it's got to be like that, okay? So I suppose I'll end this section by basically saying that I think this is one of those times where the social dynamics of World of Warcraft were pretty much at like one of their peaks, and that's what makes it so interesting to me. Next, Anchorage. While this is often remembered fondly, because it was a pretty epic thing in so many ways, th the realities were kind of less than ideal a lot of the time. This was such a tremendously ambitious um, event, and yeah, in so many ways a, a, a disastrous event, that the team pretty much have not done it since. Okay, so let's just talk about what this was. This was a server-specific event that was the culmination of months of work. It would only happen uh, once per server, so it truly was a unique and unmissable thing for players. The event itself pretty much involved spawning a whole lot of elite enemy mobs, a bunch of boss tier enemies to fight, and uh, you know, you'd fight through them. Uh, this of course only happened after months of work and an epic quest line. So basically what happened is the players in both factions handed in hundreds of thousands, like a truly staggering amount of various different resources. And then the most dedicated players, the, generally the raiders, were working on the Scepter of the Shifting Sands questline. This involved hunting down shards of the Scepter of the Shifting Sands so you could remake the Scepter. And this generally meant loads of raid-related tasks with the various different dragon flights. And after you completed the questline, you would have to wait for um, the server, the rest of the, you know, all the other people, to finish in their resource hand-ins. But then at some point you're good to go. You could ring the gong and it would start the event. Players from all over the server would flock there to take part, or at least they'd try to. The servers were not built to handle such a clustered load into a small area. People were spending hours to get to Silithus. They were getting stuck in like loading loops in the game's boats. Generally, it was just a disaster. And if you actually did manage to make it to Silithus, well, things were probably laggy as hell, barely functioning, and chances are you had a terrible frame rate as well. Plus, people could technically ring the gong at two in the morning, which is a bit of a disaster when it's only a 10 hour long event. When it worked well, it was a truly epic event, something that's special that will live on in memories, but it often didn't really work out that well. Blizzard have been very frank about this, frank about how they th now think it was too ambitious, and it's a bit of a mistake that they're not really keen to repeat um, in the future. But that said, returning to the idea of something like this would be great for the game, assuming they're confident they can get the tech right. Because even though it didn't work out, even though there was a lot of controversy, people who had the scepter weren't able to get to the gong to get their mount because they couldn't zone into Silithus, all that stuff yet, that was sort of bad that it happened that way. But if they could just have something like that happen again and work, it, wouldn't it just be amazing? I really do think it would. Next, Flight. Oh boy, Flight has been controversial 
Well, since the beginning, in TBC, it pretty much killed world PvP in the max level of content. A lot of people weren't fans of that, um, and, you know, as much as they did try to keep world PvP alive with things like Halas, still it kind of died. In Wrath of the Lich King, you were grounded initially, but you could get cold weather flying at about 77, if I remember correctly. Cataclysm had us flying since the beginning of the expansion, but then in Mop, the flying was locked until you hit max level. Now, having no flying in places like Timeless Isle and Keldenas, that's all kind of normal. But for the most part, players were used to being able to fly around the game's main continents. Warlords of Draenor had no intention of doing this. Blizzard were adamant that it was designed to be experienced from the ground, and that to fly would ruin that. You know what, in some ways they're not wrong. Imagine a game like Skyrim, but with no clip, or, you know, with flight. The world would feel tiny, the geometry wouldn't matter, more importantly, the gameplay challenges created by the geometry wouldn't matter. The idea of maybe climbing to the top of a tower to kill the guy inside, gone, you just dive bomb on everything, and there's no thought at all. But here's the thing, first of all, they let the genie out of the bag, and there's a reason why a lot of other MMOs haven't followed suit. Uh, people were used to the level of convenience, right? Second. WoW world content is very much a matter of getting across the map efficiently, it's just how it's constructed. Thirdly, let's be real, WoW's gameplay design doesn't shine in world content anyway. It's designed for raiding and dungeons, so are we really gaining that much by having the best possible version of WoW world content combat? I think that latter point's really debatable, and personally, I've always, from a design perspective, been someone who actually has lent in the direction of no flying, but with the admission that the argument over how much the geometry positively affects the gameplay, I think that's really strong in other games, and maybe a bit less strong in World of Warcraft. Maybe if it was more action-oriented MO from a gameplay standpoint, you'd think that, but less so for WoW. So, there's this discussion going on about game design, right? And I think that's great, but let's not kid ourselves. For the most part, this is a massive, massive screeching shit show. Eventually, the team did make the decision to bring flying back into Warlords of Draenor, but only after a lot of very heated debate, to the point where it kind of spilled out into the mainstream gaming press, which is a bit odd to see. Warlords' method of unlocking flight, though, seemed to work for Blizzard and their goals, and really it seems to be the model that they're going to be carrying forward, even though we still do see a small resurgence uh, in this debate whenever a new piece of content pops up. For my part, I think flying could it could work um but they would need to design zones like ice crown and storm peaks places that really benefit from that type of movement if they would actually go and do that and that's really what i i mean for me the ideal situation is sure there's some grounded areas but maybe there is something like storm peaks where it's super unique and you gotta fly and that really makes it unique and cool and have an epic scale that you're not going to see anywhere else so i think really I'm more interested in, I'm less interested in the flying debate and more interested in, can you creatively make an awesome zone that really works for flying? That's kind of my angle in this at this stage. All right, Legacy, well, we've got to cover this one. It's probably one of the largest controversies in the history of the game. Interestingly, it's also one of the most successful. This sparked off, initially, from Blizzard shutting down Nostalrius, which was a private server that emulated vanilla WoW, and it did a damn good job of emulating vanilla WoW. It let people relive that vanilla experience, and importantly, it wasn't marred by private server rubbish like cash ops. It was an actual very good gaming experience. At the time, people didn't have a terms of service friendly way to play vanilla WoW, so naturally, if the market's not providing a solution to the problem, someone's going to go and, well, provide that solution. Now, over the following years, since the death of Nostalrius, things got pretty messy. The campaign uh, got a bit louder. Follow-ups to Nostalrius happened. They were often messy and full of drama. I myself received multiple offers from pretty shady private server looking people who were like, we will pay you money to, like, do a video on our server. And it's like, no, get, what? Yeah, just a weird situation followed the death of Nostalrius. Of course, throughout the whole time, this story got mainstream media attention, and it's not that, oh, PC Gamer covered it, like, the BBC covered it. Um, yeah, so really more than we'd really seen from a WoW thing, bar perhaps the whole real name on Battle.net. I think that might have been the other one that got this big. Now, Blizz were silent for a long time, but as it turned out, much to my surprise and a lot of people's surprise, they were listening, with World of Warcraft Classic being announced at BlizzCon 2017. But since then, of course, the drama. Has it stopped? No, that would be ridiculous. It just shifted. What should vanilla be? Some people even want LFG and Transmog to be part of the deal, which... 
I mean, I get it, but I no is really my opinion. Um, based on my polling, though, what most people want is just vanilla, but with bug fixes. Now, I think for me, the interesting discussion is the mechanics. What version of vanilla do you want? Uh, the launch content of the game with the debuff slots of 1.12, uh, maybe? Uh, if you did that, how would you rebalance those initial bosses to work with the new debuff slot system? What's that? What's that going to be like? And it seems like those questions are Blizzard's focus. And Blizzard really, it doesn't seem like they're even thinking about putting LFG or Transmog or any modern system in. It's just about what version of vanilla is the best one to deliver, like, the vanilla gameplay experience that people want, uh, you know, for the audience who wants that. So next, uh, the entire of Warlords of Draenor? Pretty much all of it, really. Um, yeah, I mean, look, we, we all know this, right? Uh, if you're more interested in seeing what the full Warlords of Draenor might have looked like, you can check out a video that I recently did. But basically, wow, every bit of cut content was controversial. Uh, the original launch to Nan, Bladespire, Carabor, Movable Garrisons, Farallon, Shipyards being a copy-paste, uh, 6.1 being empty, 6.2 being a rehash, Ashran being Trashran, all these things. And of course, I contributed to this uh, a lot. I was very, very, very critical persistently throughout all of Warlords. Um, I maybe disagree with how I communicated, but I definitely do still agree with what I thought. Now, there's other things like, say, Demonology Warlocks. Uh, you know, Blizzard nerfed them hard. They then said in Q&A that that's why they nerfed them hard, because they didn't want people to play them, which didn't get the best response from players. Of course, since then, the dev communication has really improved. Um, and special props, uh, I'd say, to Ian, who um, has been doing a really fantastic job of explaining the team's decisions and also being frank about problems with the game. Just look at how we handled the Legion Legendaries recently. But yeah, Warlords of Draenor, it's like they tried a lot of things. They made a lot of bets. A lot of those bets failed. They kind of cut and run halfway through, and the whole thing just kind of tumbled down, and it was one big, never-ending controversy. If you wanted to, if you wanted to be the keem star of, of World of Warcraft, well, damn, Warlords of Draenor pretty much was the time to do that. Thankfully, though, Legion's a hell of a lot better, and it seems like Battle, as long as it's got the base setup of Legion, well, even if some of their bets and Battle fail, it'll still be great, because it's got Mythic Plus and great raids and, you know, the stuff that people care about. So there you go, that's uh, that's it for the second part of the big controversies in World of Warcraft history. Now, when doing this video, I've been more thinking about, like, what are the controversies that are actually a good story to tell? What are the interesting ones? Less about, you know, less about the drama bait and more about, like, what are the interesting stories that went down because one of the unique things about WoW is it's just called the 13th, uh, 13th anniversary, right? It's been so long in the tooth that we just do have these kind of cool stories and things that happened, which maybe they were a bit fiery at the time, but hey, it's, you know, it's been a while, we can calm down and sort of, you know, take a look back. So, there you go. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what sort of stories captured your mind as the game's uh, moved on in age. And with that, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.